So for tonight in this webinar, Dr. Alex Tang will be leading us down this uh, rabbit hole uh, to dig out this rich legacy. Now a little bit more about Dr. Alex Tang. He is the founder and director of Kairos uh, Spiritual Formation. He has offered spiritual direction to numerous persons for the last 20 years and also leads retreats and teaches spirit, Christian spirituality, spiritual formation, and spiritual direction, and also biomedical ethics to many students. He has set up spiritual directors training programs in the region, and uh, being a wearer of many hats, he is also a research fellow for the Center for Disability Ministry in Asia, the Biblical School of Theology in Singapore, and is a consultant pediatrician in private practice. He's also an associate professor of pediatrics in Monash University of Malaysia. So, so I'm going to pass the time now to uh, Dr. Alex. Hello, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Okay. So, so it is actually indeed uh, good and I thank what you Thank STM for giving me this opportunity to share on uh, uh, Eugene Peterson. So this evening, our focus will be on what is the main teaching. What does he have to for us? And more so, what are the things that we can learn? Okay, so our focus will be on Eugene Peterson, more on his teaching but more as a way that I would interact with some of his teaching, with some of the things that uh, he has taught so that we can learn more. And the focus you'll find this evening will be very narrowed in, in terms of uh, spiritual growth, in terms of uh, spirituality. So I, I, I have a... Uh, been following Eugene and I've studied under him. And uh, this is a, a corner of my library where all the books are Eugene books. Eugene, actually, uh, he's such a prolific writer that he is, actually, I have two shelves of his books. And if you have a look at this, you can see that some of my, uh, I even have his lectures, which is in cassette. Can you imagine how long ago that was when uh, he was teaching in region and uh, concerts in there and it was all recorded in cassettes. Now I don't know what to do with the cassette. I don't know. How, I need to transfer them to a digital. So there is actually a lot of things that we can learn for Eugene. But is it I think what, what strikes me and what makes me fascinated about Eugene is that he played the banjo. Now I think that any pastors who play the banjo is not too bad. Lah. I think we can listen to them. Okay. He plays the banjo. He's actually a good musician. And there's a story behind this banjo. Okay. Uh, he recorded that in his uh, biography that uh, there was this lady, uh, she met this uh, the lady in, in the town that he's working, where his church is. And he made friends with the lady, and the lady was, was uh, living with a man. They were not married, and they, they are not Christians, and uh, they are into drugs. And they are white. their life was uh, actually a bit haywired. So he made friends with her. Then after a while, she says, he asked her, you want to come to church or not? You know, I, I am actually a pastor, so I have a church. So, so she, she came one day to his surprise. And she attended faithfully church for 10 years. Okay. Now, during this time, she was actually living with another guy, which is another man. They're not married. And I, I would expect any uh, good pastor will straight away say, now that you're attending my church, you must get married. You cannot live together. But it's quite interesting to know that Eugene didn't say that. He knows that you're not supposed to live together, but he allows her to attend church. Allows her for almost 10 years. Until one day, 
she came up to him and says, Pastor, I think uh, I'll, I will continue to live with this man, but I will be celebrate. We will not have sex. And then a few years later, they are married. And, and you see, that, that's a very different way of uh, doing church, being a pastor. Well, instead of going and say, no, you must behave in that, he actually let them slowly discover. And that is something that I always uh, I find fascinating about Eugene. He believed in the slow work of God, which is something that not all of us are, uh, in our modern day life is we are so much in a hurry. No, we just cannot wait. Sometimes we say, God, why are you so slow? Uh? Please uh, hurry up. Uh. Now, Eugene uh, Hoyland Peterson, okay, he actually he was the founding pastor of Christ our King Presbyterian Church. And he was pastor of only one church for 29 years before he retired. So he is one of those rare pastors that doesn't uh, live and go from church to church. Okay? In the States at that time, and even now, it's quite usual for pastors to change church every three to five years. But he was one of those rare who stuck onto the church. Okay, and he stayed there for 29 years. And he, well, he was the one who, who actually says that a pastor should know the name of everybody in his church. If you say that, that means that you cannot be a too big a church. So he actually says that a church shouldn't more be more than 300. Because more than 300, pastor will not be able to know the name of everybody. I mean, wow, 300. For us, you know, we, we would think we love the churches, that 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. We are all into mega churches. But Eugene is actually against the type of contemporary uh, pastoral thinking. And that is in the 70s, early 70s, 80s, and 90s. He is not interested in following the fashion of the day. Okay, more about that later. Then in 91, he retired, and then he went on to Regent College, where he was the professor of theology from 92 to 98. Okay, where he teach, and all the things that, and a lot of his teaching are informed by his lived experience as a pastor, or 29 years as a pastor. So he teaches spiritual theology okay, from uh, 92 to 98. Then he retired, but he continued to teach until 2006. And then he continued, he retired, and then he continued his uh, ministry of teaching, writing, and speaking until his retirement from public life in 2017. So, so you see that this is a brief uh, uh, encapsule or brief uh, nut in a nutshell his life, that he was a pastor, he teach theology, and he's involved in, a, uh, he's a writer, you know, and then he's a theologian, he's a poet, an inventor, and you can see that even now, many people will say that, um, and well-known pastors will say that, you know, uh, Eugene Peterson is my mentor. I can say that he is my mentor. Okay, so, so that is the legacy that he left behind. Aside from his many books, you find that these are some of the books. And uh, these books are actually uh, of specific books on the Bible. I, I will recommend uh, all of them, you know, if you have time. Okay, uh, his book, Practice Resurrection, is about the book of Ephesians. Okay, it's a, it doesn't go into those uh, academic type of uh, 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 analysis, but he goes into a very practical level. Okay, he's very interested in Christian living. So how do you live up the book of Ephesians in your life? Okay, reverse thunder. 
okay, which is actually from a poem. Okay, and he says that that is what uh, the book of Revelation is. Reverse thunder. Run with the horses. Okay, that's the book of Jeremiah. Okay, and that's my favorite book. Traveling like Galatians. Jonah under the unpredicted plan. You find that Psalms, he, he actually was very much into Psalms. And then you see that the message is where he paraphrased or translated the Bible. Okay, He's, uh, he actually has a master's in biblical languages. Okay, he doesn't have a PhD, but he has, he's very good in uh, uh, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek. And he's able to translate the Bible into a modern day terms. Okay, so he paraphrased the Bible, in other words. And that becomes a message, which is actually one of the best-selling Bibles at this time. So if you have not read it, it's worth reading. But if you look at his life and see what is the main thing, you know, uh, Eugene likes to tell stories. And, and one of the stories he, 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 he told was that, you know, uh, my son, okay, Eugene's son, says that you have only one sermon. And Eugene was preparing a sermon at the time. He was a bit upset. You know? What do you mean by I have only one sermon? Okay, I have preached thousands of sermons. You know, the, the son says that, you know, you have preached thousands of sermons, but you are actually preaching the same sermon. And he actually is right. Eugene has one sermon. And his sermon is about soul care. So you see that all the things he does as a pastor, writer, theologian, poet, and mentor, is actually about soul care, or what uh, he will call soul craft. And he will say that that is the single most important thing the church needs today, that we all need today, that if we are to follow Christ, we need soul care. So that in the last, uh, this is his final five books, you know, there is magnum opus where he summarized and distilled all that he have learned into this final book, final five books, which he started in, uh, took him about five years to write. Okay. Which is actually basically about so care. You know, the first book is Cry Place in 10,000 Places which is about spiritual theology. And basically is that Christ is there. And if you read his books, you find that he's very Christ-centered. Okay. And he believed that Christ plays in 10,000 places. This is uh, uh, Hawkins' uh, poem. He says that everywhere we see, we see the face of Christ. And then the focus on the word in this book spiritual reading and how do we live we live the jesus way and how do jesus teach us to read the word tell it slant okay and then how do we live with practice resurrection so basically all these things about so care so what i want to share with you tonight is seven life hacks from Eugene Peterson. That if you distill all the things that he is in all his books and all his teaching and all that, there are seven basic hack, uh, life hacks. First is to cultivate a Christian imagination. Secondly, is that pastors as shepherd, not CEOs. Third is practice resurrection. Fourth is choose your words carefully. Fifth is Relevant is irrelevant. Obedient is. Christ is all we have to offer. And finally, subversive spirituality. And I hope that we will have time for us to discuss this in a Q&A. Firstly, cultivate a Christian imagination. I, I think uh, is, he has said it 
many times that we Christian lack a Christian imagination. Okay. I mean, we live in a time where you look at the movies, you go and the, the special effects are so impressive. We are talking about the metaverse where we can have uh, 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 augmented reality and virtual reality. So the imagination has run wild. Everything that we know can be, uh, uh, every imagination that we have can be uh, created by special effect. So much so that we are actually, what we are actually doing is following somebody's imagination. Okay. When we are experiencing special effect, we are actually experiencing somebody, the creator's imagination, not our own. And as Christian, Eugene is very critical. Okay. And you know, he 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 was, I mean, he didn't play pay much notice on Star Wars and all that. So he sort of uh, uh, bypassed. Uh, uh, the, the, the development of special effects. But he mentioned that imagination is very important because imagination is the capacity to make connection between what is visible, that means what we see, touch, and, yeah, and what is invisible. Okay. What between heaven and earth? Yeah, we can see earth, but we can't see heaven between the present and the past. Okay, the past is behind us, whether we remember it correctly or not, and the present in the future. So he said, he is saying that imagination is very important. Christian imagination, our imagination, is the means that we can see the reality in context. That means we, we can have the things that we can touch and hold and that. But without imagination, we cannot see the reality of God's creation. We cannot, we, there's no way without a Christian imagination that we can see God's creation, God's purpose for the earth because we only see one part. That's why he says it's very important for the recovery and exercise of the imagination, okay? especially in this time of special effects and all this, that don't let people do your imagining for us. Okay? There's a danger of uh, watching uh, 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 movies like uh, Genesis, The Flood, and uh, The Ten Commandments, because we let the movies do the imagining for us. Even watching the Jesus movie, the uh, Passion of the Christ, we have already let somebody else do the imagining for us. Okay, so we are following somebody's imagination. But he is saying that imagination is the mental tool we have for connecting the material and the spiritual. Okay, we need imagination to continue co to connect the material and the spiritual. Sure the visible and the invisible, the earth and heaven. So that is so important that we have the Christian imagination because with that, okay, most of, most of the time, we are focused on the uh, thinking. We are focused on what we can see and think. And, uh, but without the imagination, we cannot go beyond what is on the page. We cannot be on what is written in the book. That's why we have so much trouble with the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is rich in imagery, in metaphors. Okay. And if we take it literally, that's just a, a book with fantastic images. But with the imagination, we can actually see the uncovering of the history of God. And that is what Eugene is trying to teach us. Okay, if you look at, if you read the message, you know, in the, as he paraphrased the Bible, 
you see that he is trying to open us to the invisible, to the unreality. Okay. So that's the first point. The second point is that pastors are shepherds, not CEOs. Okay. Most of us think that Eugene only writes to pastor. No. Okay. Yes, uh, he teaches pastor a lot. He's very focused on pastor, but he's actually writing to all of us, lay people especially, who are in the roles of pastor. And for him is that pastors are shepherds, not CEO. He actually wrote four books about uh, pastoral care. Okay. Under the unpredictable part, he talks about uh, using Jonah, okay, the vocational holiness that we need to pastor or we need to lead with integrity. Okay, as then he works it as working the angles of pastoral integrity. Then the five smooth stones and the contemplative uh, pastor, which he talks about spiritual direction. So it's not only us living the life, but how do we listen to the Holy Spirit? How do we listen to God? So for him, pastoral work is not just running the church. Okay, Running the church is, is uh, 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 not all there is. I mean, he was telling that, you know, he was running the church, he, he was pastoring the church for a while and he felt that ah, this is not what I want to do. I want to be teaching the word of God. I want to uh, be praying for people, meeting people, but I don't want to, you know, keep on going for committee meetings and all that. So he actually went to his uh, uh, elders and says, I, I want to uh, resign. Okay. And the elder says, oh, okay. Why do you want to resign? Because I don't want to be an administrator. I don't want to keep things going. I don't want to keep attending meetings. And the elders look at him and say, so why? Why are you here? We can do without you. Now he got very unique elders. Isn't it? So they actually allow him, the elders and the leaders run the church, allow him to preach and to pray. So he didn't resign. And I think that for, form his ideas that a pastoral work is prayer directing. It's story making. Okay? Story that our, of our lives and of our people. Of pain sharing. That means the pastor has to go down to the people and uh, uh, share their pain, journey with them. Nay saying, which is to work in their life and say no to the influence of the world, the temptation of the world. And focus on God. This is, this is the way. Don't go this way and community building. And that is what pastoral work is. Okay? And pastoral work is not, and he was very adamant about that, is not McDonaldization and disinization. Okay, now he didn't use these two words. Okay? Uh, these two words, he, he never used these two words. But what he was teaching is actually against this. Now, what do I mean by McDonaldization? Now, all of us have been to McDonald's, so we know what is a McDonald's. Okay. And everything that, anywhere in the world you go, McDonald's is always looks the same. The building, that big M, you go in, you, the counter is the same, the chair is the same, the table is the same, everything is the same. Because McDonaldization is what they have done was to make everything reproducible, measurable. Okay. And a uh, franchise. So that means anywhere in the world, you will get the same piece of uh, uh, Big Mac. You'll get this. This is Okay. But unfortunately, the church also has become McDonaldized. In other words, the church also wants to be measurable, okay, reproducible. And you find that now the church, we're talking about mega churches and the celebrity churches and uh, uh, worship song churches. All these are reproducible, uh, uh, measurable, 
okay and and uh, and a lot of uh, uh, uh performance base no that is not what a pastor is he's saying that a pastor is prayer worship journeying nay saying that is what pastor is and decentralization okay i don't know whether it's such a word i just invented it but basically you look at our culture okay our, our culture issue is now all one mega there's one meta narrative created by disney which is actually overpowering all okay because this is everywhere you know the little princess and the uh marvel and uh, star wars and all that okay and the philosophy and the thought behind star wars and marvel is now the world's uh, culture we sort of overcome other cultures and that is not the culture of the God. Okay. It's a materialistic culture. It's a pragmatic culture. Might even say it's a pagan culture. And Peterson was very adamant that says Christians are not to be part of a global culture. So Christian, uh, he says that a pastor is not a CEO, a pastor should be of ministry of small talk. Okay, what is small talk? Not gossip, not uh, cocktail talk. You know, cocktail talk, it just talk nonsense and all that, but it talks about the common things. You know, sometimes as pastors or as leaders, you, we only talk about hi-fi things. You know, uh, every time we go, we must talk about God. You know, we don't talk about football. We don't talk about this. You know, the, these are, are secular things. We want to talk about uh, sacred things. But uh, because I'm saying that, no, nah, a Christian life involves the ordinary. The small talk is the natural language of what, where people is and where people are, what people are doing most of the time. So true pastoral calling is to be involved in the ministry or small talk, to walk be with the people where the pain is. So that's the second point. The third point is to practice resurrection. Okay, so what do we mean by practice resurrection? Well, before we have resurrection, you have to have a death before you can be resurrected. And in his this book, he argues that we are living a resurrected life. That means we are living a life that is from death. And the practices that he says that we should be living and focusing on is the worship of God and all the operations of the Trinity. And I, I, I agree with him. I think that we do not worship God enough. Okay, we ask from him a lot of things. Now, this is a COVID period, and we keep on asking for God uh, for protection for this and this is this, but we actually do not worship him. Okay, he's more like Santa Cross. And the acceptance of resurrection that from baptism, okay, how do we really understand the significance of baptism? The ho holy communion, the embrace of resurrection formation, that partaking of the holy communion is reminding again and again of the resurrection and is formative in that way. Okay. To read, to pay attention to God in attentive reading and obedience to the word and to pray okay, because to pray is to have intimacy with realities that we cannot see but we know that God is there resurrection practices involve confession and forgiveness of sin do we do that welcoming strangers and outcasts working and speaking for peace and justice, healing and truth 
sanctity and beauty and care for all the staff of creation. So then, this is practice resurrection. A body or company of people, a church who practice all these things. And that is what is important. Practice resurrection. Things that we are already doing. But let's review. Because we're doing it for so long, it becomes so commonplace that it actually loses its effect. Now we have worship service, we pray and all that, but do we really encounter God? Or we just do it because we are doing it? And being an author and a poet, he says, choose your words carefully. Now, I think that is a very uh, important point because, you know, he says that we have a prophetic vision. Okay. We have a prophetic vision. Okay. We have the word of God. And the word of God is what shows us what is real. Not the newspaper. Okay. That, not the uh, social media. But the problem is that we let the social media and the newspaper and the uh, Facebook and uh, whatever that we read dictate our perception of the world rather than the word of God dictate how we see the world, the how we develop this prophetic vision. That's why language is important. Okay, and he actually, he mentioned about languages of the church. You see, the church, there are three main languages in the church. Firstly, is the climatic or the preaching, the proclamation in the sermon, in the teaching. Okay, and then this is important. Okay, the church must always continue to have preaching. We need to preach the word of God. We need to preach God's truth. We need to preach forth. God. Okay. But aside from preaching, there is also another language, the teaching language, where we help people to understand the scripture, to diagnose the world of unbelief for people to answer questions and involve, understand our entire life and whole life in the light of God's revelation. So we have preaching, we have teaching, but it says that there is another language, the third language, the language of love. Paraclesis. It's, it's the language that is used by people who are really safe, who have been instructed in the law, but need of comfort and encouragement or discernment. And it says that this word, third word, this word of intimacy, is actually lacking in many of our churches. Our churches are so focused in teaching, in preaching, but not so much in intimacy. Okay, our people are not, are not connected to each other, are not encouraging one another, are not building up one another, are not comforting one another, are not helping one another in discernment, not joining one another and bearing one another's pain. Yeah, that's why he says the language, the third language is the language of the Holy Spirit. The language of relationship and intimacy. The way of speaking and listening that gets the word of Jesus inside us so that they become us. Okay. To get the word of Jesus inside us and become us. And I think that is what the whole idea of learning the word of God, studying the word of God, is to get the word of Jesus inside us. Not how you can dissect it, not how we, but how do we get the word of God inside us. It's not new information. It's not explanation. The words, words are on our side within us, working out the details in the circumstance of our life. It means the word of God inside us helps us to live out the life of God. Okay, so that is why language is important. Use the right word. 
the fifth life hacks is relevant is irrelevant. Obedience is. I mean, we, we have been focused on how can we be relevant to the world. You know, how can we be relevant to the millennium? We are so out of touch with the world. We want to be like them. Okay. But he's saying that if you look at it, okay, I like I like the this book, the the word the 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 uh, long obedience in the same direction. Okay, actually, this is from uh, a, a quote from uh, Nietzsche, and so it shows that uh, Peter Yatsen actually read a lot. Okay, and Nietzsche says about a long obedience in the same direction, and Peter Eugene actually says that. No, basically, as uh, as uh, Christians. We are actually two two groups. Uh, we are actually uh, one group with two roles. Firstly, we are called to be disciples. Okay. Now I know it's not something new to us, but we are called to be disciples, which are supposed to be apprentices of Jesus Christ. Okay, and and if you remember the apprentice system. Okay, apprentice system use. Uh, uh, follow the uh, master and you learn what the master do. You follow, he'll allow you to do it, you do it, and then he correct you, you do it again, and then you keep on learning, keep on learning. So we are in a growing learning relationship. Okay, A disciple is a learner. Okay, Not as a, uh, as you do it, in, you know, but as a learner in the life of God. So we uh, learn to of quiet information about God, not talk to a fire information about God, but skills in faith. So as a disciple, we are in a learning relationship, apprentice to Christ, to develop skills in Christ. I think that's, that's one thing that we need always to remember. We are all disciples. But he also says that we are all pilgrims. Now, pilgrims are people who are on the way to somewhere. That's why they're called pilgrims. Okay. And we are pilgrims because we are on the way to God, going towards God. So that's why we cannot just focus on being disciple alone. Okay. If you're a disciple, you keep on learning, learning, but not going anywhere. But we have to be disciples and pilgrim. Then we know that we're learning to go towards God, to follow the Jesus. Way to be like Christ. That's why there's this, you know, the word uh, is congruence. You find that in, in uh, Peterson's writing, he always talk about congruence, the alignment of who you are and what you do, and the harmony of the ends you seek and the means you use to achieve them, which I think is, is, is where all things fit together. That's why. Your life should be holistic, congruence, the alignment of who you are, what you do, the harmony of the ends you seek, and the means you use to achieve them. Okay. So that is what a holistic life is, a major life is congruence. The sixth point. The sixth life hack is that Christ is all we have to offer. Okay, many of us think that, oh yeah, so we have we have so much to offer to the world. You know, look at us, we are God gift to mankind. But Peterson reminds us, Christ is all we have to offer. Okay. And in the Jesus way, he emphasized that the Jesus way. Are personal. Okay, it's not giving rules and regulations and say, "Oh, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this." But it's a personal, incarnate, flesh and blood, relational, particular, and local. In other words, it's local. It's where the person is where the family is, is where the community is. 
that we are there, we show up, we are relation, and it's specific, and it's local. And compare that to how the world uh, treat people. Where people, you know, uh, programs, organization, techniques, general guidelines. Okay, so everything so that, you know, everybody becomes one size fit all. That's not how Jesus does think. Jesus is always customized. Okay, you find that, that Jesus approach each person differently. There's no one standard way. Okay. And when Jesus, okay, if you start uh, he, in the book of Ephesians, he, this uh, practice resolution is about the study of the book of Ephesians. He says that, well, the Greek has a active sense, passive sense, and the, mis the middle uh, sense or verbs. But say you look carefully, okay, in the book of Ephesians, the church itself, there are a lot of active words. In other words, a lot of things have been done to the church. And we are the church. Okay? Things that are done that, to the church that Jesus is doing to our church. That Jesus is a peace. He makes us one. He broke down the wall of hostility. He abolished the law. He created one humanity. Make peace. Reconcile. So he... Jesus is the actively involved in the church. Okay. It's not our church. It's his church. Okay. And then the passive with that is included in the church is what has been done to us to bring us near, to give us access to God, to build on the foundation, join together, build together. So Jesus is the one that we need and the one that we need to acknowledge that is very important in our life. And the last point about subversive spirituality is that Jesus is here. We are all disciples and pilgrim, but we are also witness. And as witness, we have to go forth. Okay. Now we are not go. I'll go and. Uh, well, we can go and evangelize and all that, but we are not called to be uh, uh, to change the world. That's not our job. Okay? Eugene has emphasized again and again that our job is not to change the world. That's God's job. Okay? We don't want to do God's job. Our job is to be a witness for Christ in our workplace. And he says that most of what Jesus said took place in a secular place. Mm -hmm. You find that you look at the gospel very carefully, you find that Jesus uh, doesn't uh, have uh, spent much time in the synagogue. Okay, but he goes to the, he talks, he starts teaching in the farmer's field, in the fishing boat, in the wedding feast, in the uh, public well, and all this. Okay, and more important, he says, he mentioned that work is important. So is Jesus never separated? Oh, this is secular work and this is spiritual work. And no, being a Pharisee or being a, a priest is more important than being a common laborer. No, he, he never say that. Okay. He mentioned that God is a worker. God Himself is a worker, and God Himself has not stopped working. And we have not. And we are supposed to work so that bear. We are, we are the subversive. We are there to bring witness to the world, to change the world that God is doing. He always says that, you know, our job is not to go and change the world. Our job is to see where God is changing the world, what God is doing, and go and join God there. And that is what is subversive. Okay? And that is what the Seven hacks I want to life hacks that I want to share with you. Again, I want to emphasize that what we are talking about is soul craft, uh, spiritual formation, if you want to use another word for it. 
And it's so important in our time here on earth that we focus on soul craft in our faith community, be it your church, your cell group, your family, your seminaries or, or workplace, whatever that is. Okay. The key thing is soul craft, soul care. It seems that things are, you know, we need to know what are the important things in the church today. Okay. Because he says that important things have been marginalized. The not important things have been put to the front. That's why we have things like celebrity problems and uh, we have uh, celebrity pastors and uh, seeker friends and, and all these things. And what is essential is the spiritual formation, the growth of the soul. Okay, in theological aesthetics, what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. Now, this one won't, won't win points, but this is what we should focus on to grow up in Christ. Okay, healthy in God, robust in love. Okay, so that is what it means. Okay, and all of us are called. All of us are called, and Eugene has put it very well, that what does it mean to represent the kingdom of God in a culture devoted to the kingdom of self? Okay, if you look at all around us, we are living in a kingdom of self. Okay. McDonaldization, decimalization is a culture of self. Me, I, and myself. Okay. I want it. I don't care what it do to you. It's my right. And I want it now. And that is the culture of the, of the self, the kingdom of self, which has actually come into the church. So how do we as Christians develop a robust identity in a society that pays top dollars to country singers, drug lords, all barons? Okay. How do you find vocational identity? You know, the value of our work from models that are actually provided by principalities and powers. Okay. You find that a lot of our modern day uh, achievement and success are all models provided by principal powers. Models that talk about power and image. Okay. So how are we to live our life? I'm going to stop here and uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you. So we'll begin the Q&A session now with the first one by uh, the most popular, by uh, alumni, uh, Mr. Peter Ong says, what can pastors do to avoid the trappings of the numbers game imposed on them by the church? How can we educate the church regarding this matter? Well, thanks. Hi, Peter. I, I think that is a very important question and uh, uh, very relevant to pastors especially is not to get trapped in the number scheme. Okay, I think it's very easy. Uh, no, I, I've been to pastors fellowship and uh, uh, basically everybody is to compare how many members you have you got and how many, uh, how much is your church income and all that. I think that's the number games and, and that's the way of the world. Okay, but as pastors, we are called to be different people apart. So I, I guess we have to focus on what is our calling. Our calling is to lead the people as God, to be shepherd, to teach them to the word, and to teach them to pray and walk along with them. So as long as we focus on this, then we try and then we distance ourselves from the numbers game. Okay. You know, I, I, I know it's easy and very tempting for the numbers game. 
because we love to have big churches. We love to uh, have uh, uh, big uh, uh, titles and, uh, you know, we, we love to have that. But basically, our calling is to look after the sheep. So I, I guess we have to be focused on that. And for uh, how we live and how we teach will affect our members. Yes, I, I, I know the challenge is you know, be, members coming in from other churches and says, hey, how come your church is so small? Huh? Yeah, how come you don't have this, you don't have this and all this? But the thing is that if we work together, I mean, if we, we, the community grow together in Christ, we we'll begin to realize that it's not a number. It's how we know, well we know each other and how we work together. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Peter. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Next is Srinivasa Murthy, uh, who asks, how do you differentiate between spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines? Hmm. Hi, uh, Murthy. Uh, he's from India. Ah. Okay. Yeah. I think, good question again. How do we differentiate between spiritual formation and spiritual discipline? Now, spiritual formation is the process of spiritual growth. Okay, so it is is the, the uh, uh, overall uh, uh, term for spiritual growth. Okay, for spiritual discipline, uh, the various activities we do to encourage or enable spiritual growth. Okay, so one is the whole uh, the process of growing. The other one is the activity. Okay, so so that is the uh, answer is special formation and special uh, discipline. Uh, okay, thank Thanks. you. So as we look at that line of thought, right? So we'll look at what uh, C.L. Mock and Selina Wong asks about uh, Christian imagination. So C.L. Mock asks, how do we control or regulate it so that it doesn't run wild? And Selina would like to know if there are any examples of Christian imagination so that we can relate to it better. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll start with Selena first. Thank you. Okay, uh, how do what is a special, uh, Christian imagination? Well, you find that uh, Jesus and uh, the Bible actually a lot of it uh, uses uh, a lot of words and metaphors that actually stimulate our imagination. Okay, when Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, what do you mean by that? Are you saying that we are salt? We are salty? You know, I, the only person I know is salty is the Lord's wife. It wasn't what too good, isn't it? But yes. we, we know what Jesus means because we use our imagination and say, oh, salt, you know, preserve food, give taste, you know, and uh, uh, preserve things. That is what salt is. And that is using our Christian imagination. That's what imagination is. Okay. And how do we maintain this Christian imagination? by what our imagination is developed by what we feed it, okay? If we feed our imagination all the uh, negative things, all the cruelty, violence, and all that, then it becomes that. But if we feed it with the word of God, with all is good, what is loving, what is kind, kind, and all that, and then it becomes Christian imagination. So that, that's, that's, I hope, answer the two questions. Mm. Yes, I think it does answer it very well. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to the next one. So Peter Raj would like to know, where do our churches in Malaysia stand if we would compare it to Eugene Peterson's approach? So I'm guessing that he wants to know um, how, how is the health of the church according to his uh, measure? No, that is a difficult question because uh, Malaysian churches belong to different de denominations, different approaches. So I don't think I can offer you a, a straight out answer and say, this is where I stand, yes or no. But I, I do believe that Malaysian churches, majority of them understand what Eugene is saying. Okay. But there is a longing to go the way of the world. Okay, and uh, that includes a, a majority of pastors. 
no, we want to be successful. We want to, you know, uh, uh, be well known. We want to be famous. Okay. I think that that is a temptation. But all in all, I think that Malaysian churches are okay. You know, uh, there's still hope yet. Yeah, that's great news. <laughs> <laughs> that is great news. All right. So uh, thanks again for that question. Uh, next one, I would like to combine uh, what Thomas Lowe has asked and what Yok Kim Fan has asked as well. So it's about soul care. Now, Thomas Lowe asks, how do we go about translating soul care principles from individuals to the whole denomination? Um, and then if we're looking at it, uh, Yok Kim Fan asked about how to um, how is a good way to cultivate it. So I reckon uh, we can probably look at it as in the individual aspect and then maybe at a more denominational aspect, if that's possible. Oh yeah, I must salute our uh, bishop. <laughs> yeah, thank you for asking the question, Bishop. Mm. I, I think that the, the, uh, it's a good question. How do we try, uh, translate from individual to the church? Mm. But, you know, if you look at uh, Peter, uh, uh, most of uh, Peterson's writing, he never differentiates between individual and church. For him, everything is community. Oh. Okay, so that means uh, all that he teaches, all the teaching is actually for the community which involves the individual. Okay, so I, I think that's a good start that we can, if we want to, you know, we always think that it has to come from individual to the community and then community back. But what happens if all go, we all go together as a group, as a community? We start as a community and we end as a community. I, I, I believe that that is what is, uh, what is uh, so, uh, startling and uh, insightful about his approach is that it's a community. Pastors are there, leaders are there, you know, but we are still a community. So it's not, you must have an individual and then it spreads to the community, but just do it together. Okay, I hope that answers uh, both uh, Tim's uh, and uh, uh, Thomas' question. Uh, Tim, ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. So let me just get through that. So how do we cultivate soul care in the life of a Christian? But I, I basically, I think we have to look to God. Okay, mm -hmm. have to uh, be focused on God, focus on uh, living a life that's worthy of God. And uh, in our prayer life, in our uh, word life, and uh, trying to live, be a disciple and a pilgrim. Mm. All right. Um, I think we, we leave for the book recommendations later. Lah, huh? <laughs> um, I, I can give the book recommendation. Oh, okay. okay. I mean, the, the, the five books uh, mm. is actually uh, I actually showed it before. I, oh. I, one of the slides I can make the slides available to you. Uh, mm. A good one is under uh, unpredictable plan. Okay, working the angles, five smooth stones, and the contemplative uh, pastor. Okay, so this will be good books to read. Mm. All right, that's great. Uh, let's see how what's next. Um, ah. So here is about um, Bible schools. Huh? Which er what areas do you think Bible schools need to do better to prepare pastors in church ministry? And actually, there was another question in the chat about seminaries as well. Whether seminaries are putting enough, enough emphasis or doing enough to cultivate uh, soul care in the life of the pastors and uh, seminarians. Yeah. I, I guess the seminaries are trying, they're trying, but then uh, I understand that seminaries have uh, their curriculum and they have a lot of topics to cover. Okay, so, so, but basically we have to remember that seminaries produce pastors or leaders, even though they don't become your church leaders. And then you go back to the church and you spend the next 30 years of your life looking after the church. 
So what are the essential skills you should get? And I, I think that we need to retain that, you know, uh, and, and put a, a more emphasis on uh, soul care, on pastoral care. Because what is important is that, you know, if the pastor is growing in Christ, yeah, the congregation will grow. If the pastor is, is having problem or if the pastor is way out, there will be issue in the congregation. Um, you cannot avoid that. So, so you know, I think the seminaries should be doing uh, a lot to help to them to develop their Christian uh, spirituality, their spiritual growth, their soul care, so that they will be holistic, wholesome when they graduate. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, and coming from SDM, just to answer the question in the chat, huh? I can see SDM trying their best. Huh? Uh, and, and at least in my case, uh, it has borne fruit. <laughs> so, so praise the Lord for that. And I do hope that for other students and other future seminarians, they can get through and, and learn or at least experience the spiritual formation that comes uh, through seminary studies. Um, okay, so the next one is from Esther Cole. Uh, she asked, did Eugene Peterson emphasize on any spiritual exercises? Uh, he, did, he didn't. I mean, he mentioned uh, reading, uh, uh, spiritual exercises of uh, reading prayer and all that. But there's one specific spiritual exercise that he actually spent a lot of time on. In his book, Eat. In his book, eat the book, eat the book. Okay, he talks about <laughs> lectio divina. Oh, okay. Uh, so he's actually half the book is about lectio divina. So uh -huh. that one he pays a lot of emphasis on, because I guess both of his interests in the word and in the imagination. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah, lectio divina is a very important practice that we seem to have pushed aside now. Yes. Mm. Okay. Um, this one is another one from the chat. Um, let me see how I wrote it down. Um, ah, so from the chat, there was a question asking about cultural translation of the words or the teachings of uh, uh, Eugene Peterson. Does it need cultural translation to Southeast Asia or can it be applied directly? I, I believe he can. I, I mean, I, I've been reading his work uh, for many years and uh, I, I find that because he, he deals with the basics. Mm. Okay. He, he, I mean, yes, uh, we have to understand his teaching in the context of North American uh, evangelism. Actually, he's a Presbyterian church, a pastor. Okay. Mm. So, so we know that he's addressing a North American. That's a context. But he deals with very basic principles, you know, prayer, God, word. Okay, and this can be and should be able to translate to uh, uh, Asia without much uh, uh, much uh, change. And, and, and I'm, I'm, that's why I'm very passionate about teaching this uh, uh, subject because I find that there's much that he can teach us the much we can, the Malaysian or the Asian church can learn from that. All right. So later we will have an advertisement about your coming, <laughs> uh, coming sessions. Huh? I think there's a, a part-time study about uh, the spirituality of Eugene Peterson. So for those who are interested, uh, we will give you the information later. So keep an eye out for it. Um, all right. So next one, uh, we will look at... Uh, Question from Fred Tan, who asked about subversive spirituality. Now, is it a way to look at how we are to interact with others differently from the secular world and the way Jesus would do differently compared with the ways of the world? So he's, mm, so he's yeah. probably asking about how we should interact with the world and how would Jesus have done differently? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's excellent. And uh, thank you for highlighting subversive spirituality. Okay, now uh, it, it wasn't, uh, I mean, the way Eugene uh, put it and uh, 
And the way that he learned it from the, the Bible or he studied from the Bible is that it's not, we are not being subversive for the sake of being subversive. Mm. Yeah. Is that because we believe in a different value system, we see things in a different way. So the way we want, we act changes the world. That's why we, we call it subversive spirituality. Okay, it's, it's not that we want to be subversive. Okay, it's the fact that we, being who we are, the way we live in the culture of the world today, make us subversive. All right. So basically, just following Christ, living the Jesus way, then automatically you are subversive. Um, okay. All right. That's great. Um, this is. This is from me, um, just wondering, um, because of the pandemic, you pointed it out, right? That, um, that the church has been trying to learn to sort of adjust and practice uh, spirituality differently. So one of the questions that came up during my own uh, pastoring is that when we talk about um, practicing maybe the spiritual um, uh, spiritual disciplines and also stuff like uh, self-group and family altar. Many people struggle and they worry that um, for some families, uh, the children are too old. How do we encourage them to do it? So I'm just wondering whether Eugene Peterson has an answer for that or has a way to teach us who are older to cultivate our spiritual uh, Christian imagination. Yeah, I, I, Eugene actually had wrote a book about dealing with a teenager. Oh. Okay, uh, about how he uh, uh, encouraged his uh, teenage son and how to deal with that. Basically, uh, focus on the word, focus on God, focus on prayer, but more so uh, get the children involved. Okay, get their ideas rather than trying to impose our, our thinking because most of us have this idea on what a family author is, what is uh, prayer time is, you know. Maybe they do things differently. So get them involved. I think, I think Eugene's uh, the last, he said, I learned a lot from my teenage kids. He said, mm -hmm. how not to be dogmatic about things. Okay, yeah, so, so I thought that was very interesting. Mm. That uh, yeah, we have been doing this way, but now that how maybe we can get the ideas and say how would you like to do it? Ah, oh, okay, okay. So allowing them to to lead the the particular session to yeah. share their ideas. Uh, okay, so 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 oh. you you know uh, uh, I I know you find that you know uh, prayer time and reading mm. is is boring. So now if you're in charge. How will you design it? How oh. how will you design a, a, a prayer altar or a family time? Okay. Oh, that's a wonderful question to ask. If you are in charge, how would you design? Mm. Okay. All right. So the next question, um, uh, this is from. Um, sorry if I butcher your name. Yao Chen, <laughs> uh, who says, although Eugene Peterson's The Message is a paraphrase of the Bible, do you think we can use it for both devotional and Bible study purposes? Hmm. Yes. The, the, the answer is yes. You can use it for both devotional and Bible study processes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's been quite a while since the book, uh, his, his uh, full translation. It took about 10 years to translate. And initially, as usual, there's a lot of heal and cry, whether it's a paraphrase, whether it's accurate, but that sort of died down. Okay? Because people find that actually there's not much error in the Bible, in, in his uh, paraphrase, in his translation. Okay. So yes, please go ahead and uh, use it for your devotion and your uh, reading. Mm -hmm. Because it is written in a very friendly and... Uh, uh, day-to-day uh, -day type of uh, American, uh, American uh, English. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so I find that 
you, uh, reading it, actually, uh, I get a lot of uh, new insights on mm -hmm. how to approach that particular passage or mm -hmm. sentence. Yeah, go ahead and use it for devotion. Ah, that's great. <laughs> All right. So the next one, um, this one is uh, again from uh, Peter. So he says, how can the church truly care for the souls of their pastors? And I think this comes from the, this, the very Asian context whereby the pastor has a, there's a barrier between the congregation and the pastor. And that, uh, like you were saying before, the pastor is viewed more as a CEO or someone who is a bit set apart, different from, from the congregation. So how do we break that barrier and how can they care for the pastor? Uh, I, I think that's a very good question, especially how, how uh, I like the way you put it, how can the church truly care for the souls of us? Because the problem is that in Asia, we tend to put our pastors on a better mm. you know, They are like perfect. So no, nobody will ask pastor, are you okay or not? You know, mm. I mean, pastor is going around during the pandemic, everybody, are you okay, okay, okay? But nobody actually asks the pastor, are you okay or not? Mm. Okay. And uh, uh, do you need help or not? So I, I think it goes both ways. Okay, that means pastors need to come down from pedestal, and congregation stop teaching, uh, treating pastor on a uh, pedestal, and then we try to interact, and uh, and know that pastors are human, so they need time off. Okay, I know some churches do give them Monday off. But then you all usually have council meeting on Monday, so that's where you get Monday. So you know, so maybe give some time off, a sabbatical, if you know, for them to celebrate the Sabbath, they have total rest, and also take on more responsibility. Okay, that means the leaders and elders take on more responsibility. But saying that the pastor must be willing to let go of the responsibility, you know. I mean, uh, everybody can say, ah, your tech, you know, everything also want to do, okay? But it goes both ways, eh? You want to do everything, you don't want to let go, also problem. So I, I guess it's a, uh, uh, you need to find a balance, okay? A balance that everybody is healthy and holistic and growing. Mm. Yeah, actually, I like how you were saying it, how certain pastors put themselves up on the pedestal, but then there are pastors who are put up there by the congregation. <laughs> and I think they do it inadvertently because they have their expectations. And, um, and sometimes it's a struggle lot to, to meet that expectation. Huh? Uh, so Jessica was uh, saying in the, uh, in the chat that uh, often pastors don't feel comfortable to say I'm not okay for fear of stumbling the members. And I think that's where it comes from. Uh, when members have put pastors in the pedestal, uh, expecting them to be perfect or expecting them to live a, a, a spiritual life, which is a, a very close connection with God, but that may not be the case, I think. Um, yeah. Well, I think, I think uh, mm -hmm. Jessica made a good point, is that uh, pastors should be able to tell uh, the congregation, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, don't, don't wait until they break. You know, they have a breakdown and then they say, oh, I need to take time off, you know, or I need to go on leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's too late already. Correct. Correct. Uh, so, so, so they, they need to be open to say, uh, pastor is human also. Eh? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good that uh, the congregation is aware of this. So we do yes. hope that, uh, that the pastors can receive more care. Um, so thanks again. Okay, so maybe we'll take from uh, Yak Wan, who says how to reconcile a pastor's need to run the church as demands grow against his or her needs to shepherd the flock. Uh, how does the, sorry? How to reconcile a pastor's need to run the church as demands grow against his or her needs to shepherd the flock. Uh, I, I it's a good question and uh, also it's a, a realistic question mm. that uh, that's why Eugene says, you know, uh, he would not want to pastor a church uh, bigger than uh, the, that he can know the names of the members because 
he recognized that a shepherd, you need to know the name of the sheep. So uh, you need to train people. Okay, you need to train sub shepherds, so to speak. And then you can you need to give them the responsibility to take care of uh, other people. So that means the pastor doesn't do all the work, but the pastor is always training up Timothy's, okay, disciple, uh, 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 sub pastors or sub shepherds to look after, keep, keep on training up so, so that there will be always people looking after the, so you don't have to look after everybody. And, and it's an ongoing process. You don't wait until, you know, your church grows so big that you cannot handle everything. So that means they always in mind that as your church grows, you may not be able to shepherd everybody. So you need more people. Okay. And uh, best will be your own people. Of course, you can always employ. Mm. But why don't you train up your own? Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I always believe that the church have enough people. Mm. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit is in mm. the church. Mm. And he gives to the church disciples, apostles, teachers, uh, evangelists, everything. So they are down there all sitting, waiting for you to invite them. Mm. All right. Thanks. Um, uh, then the other question is by Rachel Thomas. Uh, she asks, would it not be difficult to apply how Eugene Peterson, Eugene Peterson did church in the example of the cohabitating couple who had used drugs. Oh, okay, in the Malaysian church. All right, all right. So I, I think she's, she's worried about whether we can apply these principles for ministry in the Malaysian church. Um, I guess in that case, uh, being open to these people may be difficult for the congregation to accept. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain the example, okay? Because I, I know that it will, uh, uh, people will, all the antenna and red flag will start uh, when, we, when we, I mentioned that uh, Eugene's approach, you see, that, uh, you know, he actually walked with them, you know, he brought the, the girl, the lady to the church, and then uh, when the, they were part of the church, she didn't insist that they uh, stop cohabiting until the, the person learned that he, they, they should do it themselves, okay? And uh, my natural instinct when I first heard him say that was, that is not pastoring. We should be teaching them Christian principle the moment they enter church. But then I was just thinking on, on again and say that, well, we have been teaching people Christian principles since they enter church. And how successful I'll be. Our members are still cohabiting. Our members are still doing drugs. Yeah, we've been, we've been drumming them from the pulpit every day, every weekend. They get kind of hunt them, but they don't change. Okay. Maybe, maybe, you know, instead of scolding them, we walk aside them and allow the Holy Spirit to work on them. And the Holy Spirit to convict them so that they come on their own, they come to their own decision and they come to say, Hey, Pastor, I don't want to do drugs anymore. Okay, what do you think of that? Yeah, actually, I think one of the one of the more troubling experiences of the church have had this uh this pandemic period. Uh, members who fall away from the church or members who do not come to seek help, right? I'm sure uh, there are many horror stories of church members who were drilled even from young age uh, in the church but were willing to, to consider suicide when, when faced with the troubles that they have during this pandemic. And like you were saying before, we have drummed these principles into them, but it seems as though not to, um, they, they did not make it their own. I think that's the key, right? They did not make yeah. it their own. And yeah. so they continue to struggle. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, that's unfortunate. trust in the slow work of God. Mm -hmm. 
All right. That's a wonderful question. Thank you, uh, Rachel. So it's 9.33 now, according to Michael. So um, I guess that's the end. Um, we thank everyone for the wonderful questions and we apologize that we are unable to take all of the questions. So thank you once again, everyone, for, for joining tonight's session. Okay, so that's all from us tonight. Thank you once again and we hope you have a good night.